Court first to thank our co-sponsors for this evening's event, um, the Harriman Institute and the Department of Religion here at Columbia. Um, and also uh, a special word of thanks to the IRCPL staff for making this uh, possible on, on Zoom and for all the work that went into uh, planning and, and organizing this event. Um, so um, Sveta Petrova will be uh, moderating this evening. Uh, she is a, a lecturer in the Department of Political Science here at Columbia University. Uh, she is the author of a book uh, that came out in 2014 uh, with Cambridge University Press called From Solidarity to Geopolitics, Support for Democracy Among um, Post-Communist States. And she's currently working on uh, a new manuscript um, called From Democracy to Populism, some of the um, elements of which may feature uh, in, in the conversation. Uh, I'm I'm really grateful to Sveta for for joining us at, at our CPL and and moderating this discussion. Um, just a few words uh, as as I close out to say how the uh, the evening will be structured. Um, each of the speakers uh, tonight will talk for about ten minutes each, um, and then uh, uh, Professor Petrova will lead them in a kind of moderated conversation. Um, uh, after that is uh, wrapped up, uh, you as the audience will have a chance to ask questions. Uh, you can pose your questions at any time. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a Q&A function, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with at this point. Um, but uh, if you want to type your question in there, please do so at any time uh, that, it, that it occurs to you and Professor Petrova will um, be able to read out a selection towards the end of the evening. Uh, we will wrap up at uh, 7 p.m. Um, so without further ado, I will turn over to Tsvete Petrova, who can introduce the, um, the speakers for this evening. Thank you all once again for joining us. Good evening, everyone. Viktor Orban, a Hungarian politician who initially held liberal views, but over time turned to, to nationalist conservatism, came to power most recently in 2010. Since then, domestic and international observers have repeatedly and increasingly over time raised concerns about the long list of fundamental liberal rights under threat in Hungary. And those include the fairness of the electoral system, the, in the, the independence of the judiciary, freedom of expression and media pluralism, academic freedom, privacy, LGBTQ rights, and the protection of minorities and asylum seekers. By September 2022, the European Parliament declared that Hungary can no longer be considered a full democracy. In this illiberal turn, Hungary has been a front runner in a wave of Euro-Atlantic regime change. It is these diffusion dynamics and similarities and contrasts among the countries swept in this wave that we are here to examine today. We have three fantastic speakers who will discuss Viktor Orban and the liberal turn beyond Hungary. Dr. Kim Lane Shepley is a Lawrence Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and International Affairs at Princeton University. She started focusing on Hungary in the 90s when she worked as a researcher at the Hungarian Constitutional Court as Hungary was building um, a new democracy after the Soviet period. At that time, she also became one of the founding co-directors of the Gender Studies Department at the Central European University. When Viktor Orban came to power in 2010, he packed the Constitutional Court, canceled all gender studies programs in the country and pushed CEU out of the country. It will, to Dr. Shepley, this was a call of action. Since um, Orban started taking Hungary in an autocratic direction, Dr. Shepley has been covering developments in real time in various popular blogs and op-eds and turning her academic attention to building a case for legal intervention in Hungary by the European Union. Her work on Hungary has resulted in her election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the International Academy of Comparative Law. 
She has received the Calvin Prize for Influential Scholarship, been cited by the European Court of Justice and been declared persona non grata in Hungary. Her book, Destroying Democracy by Law, will come out next year with Harvard University Press. Good evening, Dr. Shepley. We also have with us <laughs> Dr. Ruth Genjiat, a professor of history and Italian studies at New York University. She writes about fascism, authoritarianism, propaganda, and democracy protection. She's the recipient of Guggenheim and other fellowships, an advisor to protect democracy, and an MSNBC opinion columnist. She also publishes Lucid, a Substack newsletter on threats to democracy in the US and abroad. Her latest book, Strongman, Mussolini to the Present, came out in 2020 and examines how liberal leaders use corruption, violence, propaganda, and machismo to stay in power, and how resistance to them has unfolded over a century. Good evening to you as well. Last but not least, we have with us Dr. Jamar Tisby, who is a professor of history at Simmons College of Kentucky, a historically black university founded in 1879. He earned his PhD in history, studying race, religion, and social movements in the 20th century. Dr. Tisby is the author of the New York Times, USA Today, and Wall Street Journal bestselling book, The Color of Compromise, The Truth About the American Church's Complicity in Racism. He has also written the award-winning book, How to Fight Racism. His forthcoming manuscript, The Spirit of Justice, Stories of Faith, Race, and Resistance, is coming out in August of 2024. In 2021, he was named one of the 21 faith leaders to watch um, by the Center for American Progress. Dr. Tisby has been a co-host of the Pass the Mic podcast since its inception 10 years ago. His writing has been featured in the Washington Post, Atlantic, and the New York Times, among other outlets. You can follow his work at jamartisby.substack.com and on social media at, at jamartisby. Good evening to you all. Hello. <laughs> um, so before I pass the floor to Dr. Shepley, uh, again, I want to encourage our audience to send their questions uh, using the Q&A feature as they come. Um, and once we're done with all three presentations, I will do my best to incorporate and ask each of those questions to our speakers or to the speakers that they're relevant. So without further ado, Dr. Shepley, uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much. And I'm really honored to be on the panel with these uh, distinguished co-panelists. I think my remit on the panel is to say something about Hungary. Um, and why it is that Hungary has gotten to be at the center of attention of these, these debates about the spread of illiberalism around the world. I think Hungary's gotten a lot of attention because it was the first, as political scientists would say, consolidated democracy. That is, you know, imperfect, but really definitely a democracy. It's the first one to have really become a hybrid regime, what political scientists call a hybrid regime, which is basically a regime in which it might pretend to be a democracy, but where you can no longer change your leaders through elections. So the question is how that happened and how that became a model for the world. So I think, first of all, it's important to say that when you look at declining democracies around the world, what they share is that they're mostly not weakened by, by an illegal coup. Instead, leaders tend to come to power through elections, they often campaign as populists, and it's in fact their speeches and their language that has gotten a lot of attention. But what really makes them dangerous is that when they get into power, they basically destroy all the checks on their own power, and they disable essentially the elections that could replace them. What confuses audiences about this all the time is that every step in many of these regimes that these autocrats take is legal. And so the question is, what's wrong with it? <laughs> and so what I want to do is say something about just how Orban did that, because it's his playbook that a lot of other autocrats these days uh, are using. So what happened in Hungary? Well, I think the first thing to say is that when autocrats come to power, it's not usually because 
there is overwhelming popular support in the public. It's very often because the elections in which they come to power, what I call the pivotal elections, are ones in which they're running against essentially weak opposition. Um, and that was certainly one of the things that happened in Hungary. So Hungary had been tipped over into bankruptcy in the global financial crisis in 2008. When the next election came up in 2010, there were basically four parties on the ballot in a you know parliamentary system. There was the party that ran the country into bankruptcy. There was a brand new little sort of liberal, but nobody could really tell what it stood for, a party of young people who had never run for office before. There were the neo-Nazis, and then there was Orban. And so when Orban won the election with 52% of the vote, it wasn't so much his strength, but it was the weakness of the other parties that allowed him to come to power. And then there was another trick, which was there was a Hungary had had since democracy uh, you know, was reinstituted in 1990. Hungary had a very disproportionate election law. So Orban's 52% of the vote translated into 67% of the seats in the parliament. Um, and that's another feature of a lot of these systems where autocrats come to power. There's some disproportionality in the election that gives them more seats than their popular support might have warranted. Hungary also was an unusual country in the sense that it has a unicameral parliamentary system. And that means there's no upper house of parliament. There's no independently ele elected president. The one chamber of parliament elects the prime minister. So the sort of legislative and executive powers are fused. And in that kind of system, the most important check were the courts. When Orban came to power, and I should say Orban in this whole circle, they were all lawyers. And they had this whole thing planned out before they came to power because they had hired a bunch of private law firms while they were out of office to design this whole legal program. They started shoveling hundreds and then thousands of pages of laws through their compliant parliament. So in Hungary, they had two thirds of the seats in the parliament and conveniently for them, the constitution as they inherited it could be amended with a single two thirds vote of the parliament, which is to say they could put themselves above the law because they always had the requisite majority to change the constitution. And so they amended the constitution 12 times in their first year to make possible what happened next, which was the introduction of a totally new constitution and a whole series of laws that went with it, the effect of which was to capture the highest court that could have told them this was all unconstitutional, <clears throat> to me, to capture the election commission that was going to rule over all future election disputes, to capture control of the media through creating a regulatory body that was going to beat the pluralism of the media out of the media. Um, they controlled the uh, central bank. They controlled the audit office. They controlled every single branch of government. They captured the public prosecutor so that no one from the governing party was ever prosecuted. And they managed to defund the political opposition, its newspapers, its parties, its NGOs, and more. And so all of that meant that within just a few years, there was this kind of blitz activity in which all of the opposition, you know, every place where the opposition might have had a toehold to stand, you know, to push back, all of that was eliminated. Uh, and every step was legal. Because this hadn't really happened like that, the European Union, the Council of Europe with its European Court of Human Rights, even the U.S. were really not aware of what they were seeing because of the, the nature of the takeover. But the crucial thing was that really after 2013, there was never any opportunity for anyone to push back against Orban domestically. And it took, you know, probably 10 years for the rest of the world to realize that. Now, one of the things about our, our session today is that the word religion is at least in the title of one of the sponsoring organizations. And I think it's a really good thing to focus a little bit on Orban because he, he portrays himself as the defender of Christian Europe. And his idea of Christian Europe is kind of mono-ethnic um, Hungary for the Hungarians. They've ranted against Muslims. They've you know conducted anti-Semitic dog whistling political campaigns. Um, but if you look beneath the surface at what Orban has done to the religious organizations in the country, one of the things you'll see is that he's no defender of Christian Europe or Christianity in any sense. 
When Orban came to power, there were about 350 registered religious organizations in Hungary, religions and pieces of religions. And one of the first laws he passed in 2011 was a law that cut the number of official religions from 350 down to 32, which is to say all of the others, more than 300 registered churches were suddenly out in the cold. They had no legal status. They could not any longer count on the tax deductions and, and preferential tax treatment that they had. Most of these churches folded and left the country. Um, and the ones that were left were sort of repurposed by Orban into organizations that have to do the state's bidding in order to keep their, their official status. Um, so for example, um, Hungary has a minority population the Roma, who have been discriminated against for centuries. Um, and this is not unique to Orban. The Roma are in a bad condition. And in particular, one of the forms of you know, discrimination against Roma is that many of them were labeled mentally disabled and channeled into special schools. The European Court of Human Rights ruled when Orban came to power as a result of cases brought by you know, under prior regimes that this kind of educational segregation could not go on any longer. And Orban, who had no intention of desegregating the schools, decided to lean on the schismatic Lutheran church, uh, no, I'm sorry, the schismatic Methodist church, to take over these segregated schools for Roma kids and suddenly proclaim them religious schools. And now they've gone back to the Court of Human Rights and said, you can't make us, you know, disable these schools or to integrate Roma into the mainstream of Hungarian schools because they have chosen religious education, which is privilege. But the particular school, the particular religion that took them in had no particular connection to the Roma. This was just Orban leaning on the churches that need Orban for state policy, you know, in order to be able to kind of cover up the discrimination against Hungary's biggest minority. So that's just one example. But you know, the other weird thing, and I'm going to sort of close with this, is that Orban's gotten a lot of attention for all of his intolerant, his intolerant version of Christian Europe. But it, Hungarians are not particularly religious. So the last Eurobarometer, which is a survey done of, you know, of most European, of all European countries on some issues each year, it found, they found out that only 14%, 1-4% of Hungarians said that religion was important in their private lives. Only 17% attend religious services at least once a month. And among those aged 16 to 25, two thirds say they have no religion at all. So if you think that Orban is defending Christian Europe because his people are making him do this, that is absolutely not the case. <laughs> Instead, what Orban has done is to really preside over the destruction of the autonomy of churches and the mobilization of churches for his goal, which I want to repeat, is simply to concentrate all power in his hands. And this is not about ideology in the sense that he claims it. It's really all about power. And I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. ben -Giet, you have the floor next. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here uh, in such good company. And um, so um, Kim uh, already talked about um, the influences of uh, Orban's system of electoral autocracy. And I'm, I'm so glad we're doing this, this uh, uh, event because I think that um, we need to do more work uh, or more work needs to be done by someone on all of these networks of um, culture, soft power networks, other kinds of networks that are forming um, across continents to create this um, new kind of far right civilization, this new autocratic civilization. And it's interesting for me to see this happening because my first book, um, in a long time ago, fascist modernities was about how fascism was transnational and these uh, talking points and institutes and exchange programs and networks were forming to, to spread, you know, fascism. And so 
you know, we can trace these and, and, and Orban's uh, Hungary has wanted very self-consciously to be a hub, uh, a guiding pole of these things, um, including projects to train the new elite, you know, who would a transnational elite of political cultural operatives to spread this kind of these talking points on gender and civ quote civilization and all of these things. So, you know, you have Brasilia, you have Rome under Meloni, uh, Warsaw, you know, of course, Budapest and and Washington, D.C. with the, the GOP, which has been extremely influenced uh, by Orban, which is um, and, and again, I won't go into the electoral autocracy so much because uh, Kim explained it very well. But, you know, education and gender policy, I, I will talk about a bit. And um, the, you know, Orban and other illiberal kind of uh, right wing uh, strongmen, they really want to discredit liberal democratic models of education um, to create a kind of new um, autocratic political culture, a new people, uh, operatives who are going to be instilled with these values. And as someone who grew up under communism, Orban knows the power of political socialization and also knows that universities have always been sites of resistance to, to strongmen and to authoritarian regimes. Um, so the types of things that um, he's done that uh, other you know places are doing, and and people like Ron DeSantis, his his people are openly mimicking. It's not just changing the content of what can be studied, um, as when you know Orban banned gender studies in 2018, which and and what that happens in universities often precedes legal changes. So we had that ban 2018. And then you had the 2020 end of legal recognition of intersex and transgender people. So you, you're changing the content, but you're also trying to remake the purpose of, of education and make educational institutions into places that reward intolerance, conformism, and, and other values and behaviors that authoritarians want and that are not good for democracies. So um, sites of, you know, classically, and, and Orban knew this under communism, universities are sites of informers, of suspicion and of fear and indoctrination. So he's he's got some of this, and then he's also uh, done things that resemble uh, Republican, you know, initiatives and ideas, uh, de slowly defunding public education, uh, he's subtracted 16% at least from the budget over the past decade. Hungary already has a teacher shortage. And then, of course, uh, all of these laws and harassment uh, makes uh, you know it harder to find people who want to remedy that teacher shortage. And we're having this, especially in red states in, in the U.S. as well. And uh, a law, the latest, uh, one of the latest laws, uh, placed uh, education policy under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Interior, which also is in charge of law enforcement. And so this kind of surveillance culture um, to make sure that teachers are not, you know, um, teaching the wrong thing to kind of uh, criminalize and corrupt youth and playing on fears of what happens to your children when they're out of the home. Um, and that goes with homophobia with racism. So this is a, a toxic cocktail um, that has affected educational institutions um, and has an analog um, in, in the United States. And so, um, you know, and of course, gender issues that, the, again, there's this kind of standardization of talking points that circulates among these capitals. And then in, you can add in the state capitals in, in the US uh, about, you know, persecution of LGBTQ people, characterizations of them, the values that they supposedly will, um, you know, um, circulate to ruin society. Um, all of that, uh, Orban's Hungary has been very important as well as the pro-family stuff, which if you study fascism and pro-natalism, 
Um, and, you know, that, that era, um, a lot of the social welfare assistance policies are, are familiar, as well as I do want to just stick in there um, the example of Hungary in supposedly what, well, what's called, what some political scientists call gender washing, where you you promote women to very visible positions. And Katalin Novak is a good example, first female president of Hungary. She was in the Ministry of Family. And yet uh, many of the positions that they are taking are um, you know, against uh, reproductive rights uh, and, and not really helpful to women. And so there's a new, Hungary um, is, is part of this um, tendency that I believe we will see develop more, certainly with Meloni in Italy. Uh, that's another very good example. And who knows, Nikki Haley uh, is e inching up in the polls uh, as DeSantis um, self, um, he flames out for lack of a more elegant word. Um, so I think that we'll be we'll be seeing um, the, the echoes of the Hungarian model there too. So, and of course, uh, I do want to say though uh, that I've been watching um, uh, Hungary in terms of how do we strike back? How do we push back against uh, these autocrats? And as you know, Hungary was one of the places in 2022, there's been many elections in Italy and other places where the, in Turkey, the opposition was defeated. So what are the lessons there also for the US? Um, Poland had a different outcome. And I, it's as, as Kim's um, pr presentation set up very, very beautifully why it's become so difficult, so very difficult to defeat uh, the incumbent, um, you know, uh, no matter how powerful your presidential candidate might be or your, uh, how much unity you have, uh, the disparities in getting your message across because of domesticated media makes this very, very challenging. But one thing I do want to point out that um, happened in Hungary that also is happening in several places is um, that the opposition um, chose a conservative Christian politician, Peter Marquise, as its representative to to be the face to you know face off against Orban, but um, did a kind of um, uh, how would you put it? Uh, conservative move or, or defensive move of moving to the right by including in the opposition coalition Jobbik, the far right party, thinking that that would siphon uh, voters away from Orban's party. Instead, the opposite happened. And the Jobbik voters didn't want anything to do with the progressive elements of the coalition. And so 800,000, <clears> excuse me, 800,000 Yobik voters defected to Orban's party. So this backfired. So one of the lessons is that um, if you have a far right autocrat and you're trying to um, you know, push back against him, you want to have a true progressive alternative. You don't want to move so far to the center that it seems or include elements. So it seems like you're almost mimicking uh, that. And the, Tur the Turkish opposition did this in becoming extremely anti-immigrant uh, during its its own recent uh, campaign, so these are things that I'm watching, and uh, Hungary is is a case study of how how much how little room there is to maneuver in terms of institutions and getting your message out, and so the choices you make in terms of electoral strategy become all the more important. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much for these remarks. Um, I would now like to invite Dr. Tisby to share his comments. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone for tuning in to this. Glad to uh, make your acquaintance virtually. Thank you to my co-panelists for their informative and quite frankly chilling presentations, but uh, it is better to know what is happening than to pretend as if it's not happening. So I'm gonna do my best to uh, share my screen here and um, hopefully you all see that. I wanna bring it to the United States and talk about illiberalism, illiberalism 
and white Christian nationalism in the United States. And so just to begin, it's really no surprise that Viktor Orban and his brand of nationalist politics really serves as a pattern for the anti-democratic efforts of the far right in the United States. Leaders like Orban and, and his counterparts in the U.S., they want to use the legitimate levers of democracy, as we've heard, uh, namely voting and elections, to force a narrow political, social agenda on the nation and against the will of the majority of people. Uh, there are instances of the far right in the United States welcoming and celebrating Viktor Orban, notably at the Conservative Political Action Committee Conference, or CPAC, in March of this year, uh, where Orban stood up uh, in this crowd of uh, Republicans mostly and said, Hungary is an incubator where the conservative policies of the future are being tested. And I think that really encapsulates the fascination of the far right in the United States with Orban and the politics that he's using in Hungary. They're looking at that nation as an incubator, as a test case, as a model, as an example for what they want to happen here. I think they were also very encouraged by his description of his country. He said that Hungary is, quote, an illiberal Christian democracy. And uh, by illiberal, uh, he's moving away from the individual as sort of the core of a, a nation and its population to uh, a collective or particular communities, which, of course, in his view, is a very narrow constituency. The, I think the far right here in the United States would, are fairly salivating at the ways that Orban has um, cast the nation as Christian in its foundations, in its trajectory. And uh, this was captured in the preamble to the 2011 uh, constitution in Hungary. And the preamble says, we're proud that our King St. Stephen built the Hungarian state on solid ground and made our, part, made our country a part of Christian Europe 1000 years ago. And it goes on to say, we recognize the role of Christianity in preserving nationhood. We value the various religious traditions of our country, uh, although the practice would belie that second statement, uh, but literally writing Christianity into the Constitution. And in the U.S., many on the far right, under the banner of, they unite under the banner of white Christian nationalism. So they won't typically use that term, white Christian nationalism, although there are a few exceptions, such as Marjorie Taylor Greene, who says proudly that she's a Christian nationalist and wants to uh, co-opt the term into something positive. That description is nonetheless appropriate. Um, I think white Christian nationalism is critical for us to study. And I've said it again and again, and I will continue saying it, that white Christian nationalism is the greatest threat to democracy in the United States and the witness of the church in the United States. Contrary to the protests of the far right, when I use that term, white Christian nationalist, white Christian nationalism, it's been defined again and again and again, because they'll always say, well, nobody knows what it means, whatever it is. I'm going to give you a few definitions. Uh, the first one comes from Amanda Tyler. She is the head of the Baptist Joint Committee on Religious Liberty, championing the separation of church and state. And she says Christian nationalism is a political ideology and cultural framework that seeks to merge American and Christian identities. Another definition is given by Samuel Perry and Andrew Whitehead, two sociologists who wrote in their book, Taking America Back for God, that Christian nationalism is an ideology that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civic belonging and participation. And you'll see that asterisk next to Christianity because as they explain, Christian in this sense represents more of an ethno-cultural and political identity that denotes a specific constellation of religious affiliation, which is evangelical Protestant mainly, cultural values, conservative, race, white, and nationality, American-born citizen. 
Uh, I like um, another definition by Philip Gorski and Samuel Perry because they talk about white Christian nationalism as a deep story. And I think that's powerful because what what this ideology is truly is a narrative that people tell themselves to explain their worldview and their reality. And so Gorski and Perry say that white Christian nationalism's deep story goes something like this. America was founded as a Christian nation by white men who were, quote, traditional Christians who based the nation's founding documents on Christian principles, and that the United States is blessed by God, which is why it's been so successful, and the nation has a special role to play in God's plan for humanity, but, and this is the fear factor, these blessings are threatened by cultural degradation from, quote, un-American influences, both inside and outside our borders. And lastly, <laughs> my own definition is that uh, white Christian nationalism is an ethno-cultural ideology that uses Christian symbolism to create a permission structure for the acquisition of political power and social control. So I really like that phrase, permission structure, because that's how religion is functioning here. Uh, as was mentioned before, it's not that these leaders are strict religious adherents or, or very spiritual people in their personal lives or their track record before electoral politics. It's that they're using religion to really give a, 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 a divine imprimatur, a supernatural, unassailable veneer to their pursuit of power, which is what it's ultimately about. It's about the acquisition of political power, but also to influence the culture and using these legitimate levers of democracy once they're in office to change the rules so that they can never get out of office through a democratic process. So that's what we're dealing with here. And in the United States, they're looking to people like Orban as exemplars of people who have ascended to the highest levels of political power and have effectively strategized to keep themselves in power and enforce and force a vision of the nation on the people, typically against the majority, the will of the majority of the people. In the United States, as we think about this banner of white Christian nationalism, which is the guise where, where these authoritarian uh, tactics really fall under, there's a long history to it, but it really became part of the national conversation, I would say, uh, at the attempted insurrection on January 6th, 2021. If you go back and look at pictures of the insurrection, you see, you know, flag that says, Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president. You see this uh, very European looking Jesus, uh, despite the fact that he was a brown skinned Palestinian Jewish person um, with wearing a MAGA hat. You see uh, Bibles, crosses, and even in the actual chambers of Congress, you had the so called QAnon shaman saying a prayer in Jesus' name. And it said, quote, thank you, divine creator God, for surrounding and filling us with the divine omnipresent white light of love. Interesting choice of words there, white light of love and protection, peace and harmony. Thank you for allowing the United States of America to be reborn. Thank you for allowing us to get rid of the communists, the globalists, and the traitors within our government. We love you and we thank you in Christ's holy name, we pray. Amen. I just think that's an incredibly uh, poignant example of white Christian nationalism at work in its most illiberal form in a violent attempt attempted uh, to subvert a lawful presidential election. So just to round out here, you know, my burden as a historian and a racial justice advocate is twofold as we talk about illiberalism and specifically white Christian nationalism in the U.S., one, that we recognize that white Christian nationalism actually has a long, violent, anti-democratic history in the U.S. This is not something new. It might be new, a new phrase or a new conversation for some people, but the, the ideology and the practices are not new. And then two, uh, to really point us that to the antidote to this virus of illiberalism and white Christian nationalism in some ways is alternatives such as black 
Christian patriotism. So what I want to argue there is that there are other approaches to faith and politics other than white Christian nationalism, other than this illiberal uh, manifestation that we see using religion as a cover to acquire political power. So just two examples briefly. Um, the founding of the Ku Klux Klan, it's really a case study in white Christian nationalism. So most people may not realize that there were actually three waves of the Ku Klux Klan, the most notorious white supremacist racist group in the United States. Um, the first founding was in 1866, right after the Civil War, to kind of re-enshrine white supremacy after the abolition of race-based chattel slavery. The third iteration was in the 1950s and 60s as a way to push back against the Black civil rights movement of that era. But the second wave was really, in many ways, the most widespread and virulent um, of the, 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 the waves of the Klan. And that was birthed in 1915 on Thanksgiving Day, uh, a group of white men led by a former white Methodist minister went up to the top of Stone Mountain, Georgia. Uh, Stone Mountain features uh, the uh, in bas relief, three Confederate so-called heroes, um, Stonewall, Jackson, Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. They go to the top of this mountain. They do a couple of things. They, they, they um, build a cross and they light it on fire. Uh, th they also build an altar. And on that altar, they put three objects. They put a Bible, a sword, and the American flag. And today it might be the Bible, the American flag, and an AR-15. But that symbolism is powerful of this religious veneer through the Bible, um, the sword or a gun to represent the violent uh, uh, repression of any opposition, and the American flag to say that this is what America is truly about. And that is that symbolism remains uh, very relevant and salient today with, you know, the sort of God and guns ideology, uh, the rise of political violence in the United States to enforce these far right uh, extremist policies. Um, and even this idea that the U.S. was a Christian nation, that's such a recent phenomenon in many ways. For instance, uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance, we say uh, one nation under God, but that phrase under God wasn't even added until 1954, which was actually a way to differentiate the United States as a democracy against rising communism um, in places like Russia after the Civil War, uh, after, after World War II. And lastly, I'll say a, a, a few words about uh, what I call Black Christian patriotism. So again, a, a different way of viewing faith and politics. So the Black church has always been an advocate for a more inclusive democracy, and it's seen the Black church as integral to that endeavor. Uh, so there has been this sort of connection between faith and politics, but two very different ends. I love this quote by uh, a minister named Charles H. Pierce. He was an abolitionist. He lived from 1817 to 1887, and he was a, a black minister in Florida. He said this, a man in this state cannot do his whole duty as a minister, except if he but looks out for the political interests of his people. So he was saying that 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 as a um, faith leader, he couldn't even effectively uh, shepherd the the people that he was in charge of if he didn't look out for their political interests because they were facing segregation and uh, white racial terrorism, and he needed to use the levers of the democratic process to actually truly protect his people. And that tradition continues today. We can look at figures like Clementa Pinckney, who often gets left out of the conversation, but he was one of the Emanuel Nine who was killed by a white uh, supremacist at the uh, Emanuel AME Church in um, Charleston, South Carolina. He was an elected, a state elected representative, and he was a minister. We see it in folks like Senator Raphael Warnock who is uh, a minister who holds the, the same pulpit that Martin Luther King Jr. did in Atlanta. Um, we see it in folks like Latasha Brown, who uh, leads Black Voters Matter. And it, it is a tradition that continues today. So I just want us to remind ourselves that there are other traditions, um, be they religious or not, 
that uh, take a very different view of what uh, democracy could look like and truly want it to be a multiracial participatory democracy as opposed to an illiberal um, authoritarian one. So we should know about these things. These are massive threats to both the state and the church. And I'm very grateful for opportunities like this to be able to talk about it. So let me stop the share if I can. <laughs> Thank you so much for these presentations. Um, at this point, I'd like to encourage our audience to send in their questions um, so I can pose them to the speaker speakers. And as we wait for those questions to trickle in, I wanted to, question, to ask some questions of my own. You all have touched so nicely um, on the social and cultural processes that underpin this illiberal turn in Hungary, Europe more broadly, but also the US. I wanted to ask you a question that allows us to round this more historically. I wanted to ask you to discuss the political economy of this illiberal turn. Again, it's my understanding that the concentration of power in Hungary and also in the US is not just in terms of political power, media power, but it's also a concentration of economic power. So I wanted to hear if you have any thoughts on how important that element, the political economy of liberalism is to the success of, of this wave of regime change. I could start that off, um, Thank you. if that's okay. Uh, it was very revealing that the, the first thing uh, that the new Speaker of the House did was to, um, you know, they, they want to have this, uh, their primary goal uh, is to allow the, the rich to pay fewer taxes. And, and we, um, we think of authoritarianism, uh, rightly, as imposing more controls on people, things that you can't say, etc. But um, authoritarianism, both in its um, alliances sometimes with neoliberalism but also practices of plunder is also about removing controls on uh, remo removing regulations removing controls on not only the rule of law but uh controls against corruption so i i have a chapter in strongman which goes over a, a century and has uh, america in it trump's america uh there um, where practices of plunder are extremely important. Um, so, for example, in Trump's America, they rolled back over 100 environmental regulations. In Putin's Russia, the state uh, and, and Erdogan's Turkey, this is something we just need to hear way more about. Uh, uh, the state it, you know, becomes a plunderer of assets. And when it's fully realized, like in Putin's regime, it's a kleptocracy, but um, and so this is possible because um, it, the the checks on corrupt behavior are are lessened, and and the lawless are uh, rewarded under authoritarian um, environments. So that in our in our country, election deniers, election denial is a form of corruption, um, doing things so the very rich. Um, don't have to pay taxes. That's also a version of fraud. Um, so this kind of defrauding the public can be seen, um, whether it's through fixing elections, uh, lying to the public uh, through propaganda, or arranging um, the, pol the political economy and the econ economic, um, you know, uh, laws and infrastructure so that people can steal. Um, with impunity. And that's, I'll just make a final point. One of the major things that uh, you see in authoritarian history is um, there's a whole list of people who ran for office while they were under investigation. And the point of coming to power, and this is not understood well enough, uh, including for Trump, is not governance. It is to adjust the judiciary so that you can steal with impunity and you will never be prosecuted. 
So you, so most people would not, if you're in, if you've got charges or indictments and stuff, you wouldn't want to run for office if you're a nor, quote normal politician. Strong men, they really want to run for office. They're impelled to run for office because they need to get back. And the recent Netanyahu, laser focused on judicial reform because he has all these charges, and they're very dangerous because of that. Um, and then once they get there, they they do everything possible to prevent them from being prosecuted. And that's why the lawless um, are rewarded. And uh, Jamar's uh, concept of permission structures is important in this realm as well. They give permission for people to be their worst selves and they reward people for being their worst selves. Yeah, if I can, first of all, I apologize for my camera. I have no idea what happened. This is the first time I just turned it off and on and I became a <laughs> weird color. So I switched to black and white. So sorry, it seems to work that way. Uh, I just want to add to what to what Ruth said, because I think that that certainly in Hungary, I mean, Orban's rationale for existence has nothing to do with Christian Europe as, you know, everything that Chamar said about the opportunism of religion being, you know, used for purposes that are really not to express his deep faith, which he doesn't have. Um, all of it is about transferring public money into private pockets. And that's really what Orban is all about. And the rest of this is creating a system. And I, I love this idea of these permissions, right? These permissions of power that allow that money to flow without any forms of check, without any forms of oversight. So, you know, I think behind a lot of these, you know, moves toward autocracy are exactly that. But there's another political economy point I, I wanted to add, too, and that is that Orban would probably not have come to power if there hadn't been the financial crisis. It was the thing that knocked the, you know, knocked all of his competition out of the running. Um, it was something that, you know, made him the obvious candidate in 2010. Um, and I've seen this also, right, which is when, you know, countries and especially it happens when countries are bankrupt international financial institutions come in, impose austerity. This is the East European story, right, through the 90s, where that austerity turns the public against any form of liberal government, whether it's you know socially liberal, politically liberal, economically liberal, all the liberalisms get bunched together and rejected forever. And what looks like you know governments, what people then want, is somebody who can stand up to these financial institutions, right? So there's a kind of political economy around the creation of the opportunities for these folks to come to power as well. Let me say, I cannot wait for this recording to be made available because everyone needs to hear these remarks. Um, incredibly clarifying. And I'm glad you bring up political economy because in the United States, what, what we're really talking about is, is a plantation economy. When you look at the history of the United States, so much of it was determined um, by the attempt to protect the financial interests of plantation owners, which is slaveholders, right? So, so much of it from whether missionaries could proselytize to enslaved people to how you counted people for the purposes of representation in Congress, the the the, the three fifths uh, clause in the Constitution, who counts as a full citizen, and how do you count them for the purposes of voting? The forces pushing back against democracy are the one percent. They're the wealthy elite, which up until the Civil War were plantation owners. At one point in the antebellum era. Uh, there were more millionaires per capita in Vicksburg, Mississippi, than anywhere in the country. Most people never heard of Vicksburg, but that's that's cotton country, it's plantation era, area. And then the Civil War, the war to the war over slavery, was because uh, enslaved people were considered chattel. They were considered property. They were money. They were investments, and people wanted to protect that. They also wanted to exploit that. That's the whole idea of slavery, is that you don't have to pay your labor. So they exploited the labor of enslaved people. And then the war, they call the Civil War um, a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. 
So the rich, the wealthy plantation owners are the ones who drew the line, said, we are going to separate from the union. We are going to go to battle over it. Oh, but not us, the wealthy, the poor white folks will send you off to die. And that's been a story that has been consistent, I'd say, throughout the world, but certainly in U.S. history of pitting um, different cultural and ethnic groups against one another, even though they're sort of in the same position economically. Uh, because of these interests of this, you know, top one percent, the wealthy elite, uh, who are looking for more uh, out of out of the politics and the economy. Thank you so much. Um, I want to pick on a point that sort of came through all of your comments. Um, they mostly focused on the domestic environment um, and what happens in each country to allow for this illiberal turn to happen. But I wondered about the international environment. What was so permissive about it um, as to allow, perhaps, contribute to this illiberal turn in the countries that you study? Maybe I could start with that. So, uh, so absolutely. So one of the things uh, that was that may sound strange about what, what was permissive for, for example, Hungary itself, was that Hungary had already joined all the most exclusive clubs there were. It was in the European Union, it was in Council of Europe, it was somewhat less exclusive, but also in NATO. And what that did, both, both the EU and NATO, let's take them, neither one has the ability to throw out any member. Council of Europe does, okay, but those two didn't. So once Hungary was in, there was nothing much they could do to throw Hungary out. That meant that Hungary then had all the inside information from two of these exclusive clubs, which became, you know, one of the ways that Orban has bargained his power um, into, you know, um, how to put it, getting favors from Putin's Russia. You know, I always wonder when Russia's giving all this stuff to Hungary, what they're getting back. And we don't have concrete evidence, but certainly disrupting the internal workings of these clubs is something that these autocrats can uh, either sell or bargain <laughs> to outside powers. So there's a sense in which, you know, that's one thing. The second thing is that people used to ask me why the Hungarians didn't like rise up and object to this the way the Ukrainians did in 2014, for example, when they also had a, shall we say, a not democratically responsive government. Excuse me. And here too, I wanna say the EU is partly the difference, right? If you are ups if you're fed up with your government in Hungary, you can live and work in any of the other member states of the EU. So the opposition leaves, whereas in Ukraine they couldn't because they didn't belong to these clubs. So weirdly, you know, the EU has actually partially enabled this to happen. At the same time, it hasn't really been able to control it. So that's just sort of a slightly counterintuitive way in which I think the international environment has helped with Hungary. Um, I would add um, one thing that changed is the ascent of Putin to, uh, you know, information warrior, supreme dispenser of talking points, funder of secessionist chaos, um, and and who knows, you know, indirectly, uh, lots of politicians, uh, puppet master, blah blah blah. So it. It, if you if you graft it, there's like a a movement of sympathies and and things and patron relationships that coalesce around his figure. Um, and I my book uh, it, um, is never going to be translated into Italian, although maybe Berlusconi's dead now. But it starts with the the under uh, understudied patronage relationship of Berlusconi and Putin. And, and Berlusconi ended up, you know, parroting his talking points, becoming uh, just like Gerhard Schroeder, one of the um, greasers of the wheel for Russian talking points and influence into Europe. And he's had a series of these people. Um, so that's that's one thing. And Trump Trump is in and and it's the GOP. And we now we find out uh, that the new speaker, who's so emblematic uh, in so many ways of the House had some campaign contributions from a 
a Russian linked source. So they're everywhere. They're everywhere. So that's one thing. Another that, um, you know, Trump's Trump's um, agenda was always twofold. First was to wreck American democracy and establish himself as an autocrat. And governing was not the point. It was making money off of, uh, you know, public office and consolidating his power, getting access to intelligence, blah, blah, blah. Just a totally venal and transactional view of, of the world. But it was also to sabotage America as an international force, as a democracy. And I'm really, uh, I'm so chagrined and upset by um, the, there's no other word for it, the sabotage that uh, GOP lawmakers are doing uh, through Tommy Tuberville, who is sitting on hundreds of military appointments. Um, that's sabotage of American power, national security and power. Rand Paul, who we know is pro-Putin, he has a record of this, sitting on diplomatic appointments so that now there's a crisis in the Middle East. We don't have ambassadors in many important key places. So these people are saboteurs um, who who are not only wrecking democracy at home, um, but trying to, um, again, you know, have a, an international environment in which the U.S. as a democracy is a minor player. And that's also, of course, the the point of the um, Russian uh, Chinese entente that and, and the, the declarations go back and look at the declarations in the fall of 2021 that the Chinese and Russian ambassadors made and then the heads of state made. It's all about taking America down. And the GOP is a full partner in this. And that is really scary, um, qu quite apart from all the things that they're doing inside the country. Um, so th those are things that shifted. And a lot of them track back to the ascent of Putin and his um, his ability to uh, have his power verticals and his kleptocracy. Um, so he had lots of money to, to do things um, and to get uh, clients. Absolutely. Not much to add to that, but just to highlight and underline uh, Trump's uh, just sort of obsession with Vladimir Putin and the rise of Trumpism it was really a remarkable shift in uh, far right politics that for generations had set up Russia and communism as the mortal enemies of the United States and even accused, you know, any sort of social progressives, um, be they civil rights advocates or um, women's rights advocates, they all they lumped them in as communists and uh, the Red Scare and, and everything of that nature. But I think it's also that it's it's that strongman idea that, that that Trump really wanted to be like a Putin, like an Orban. Um, but also, as we are finding out more and more about Trump's uh, web of nefarious business deals, seeing the international dimensions of those, and knowing that he had hundreds of millions at stake potentially in other countries, and the, the ensuring that certain leaders stayed in power and certain business interests were protected that would uh, enrich him personally. Again, uh, as as was said, you know, this is about funneling um, money private into private pockets. So that was a big aspect that's happening on the international stage as well. Thank you. Thank you for discussing um, the actors part that are part of the Euro-Atlantic space as, as being impotent to um, arrest this illiberal turn and complicit in it as a result. And also for bringing up the rise of China and, and Russia as another notes of liberalism, but also promoters and sponsors of what the Orbans um, around the world are doing. I want to bring in a question from the audience that looks even further towards what used to be known as the developing world or the third world. And it's a question that asks, thinking about spreading this illiberal model around the world, how do Modi and Xi fit in? And are there roots of this forming in Africa? 
actually, so in this <clears throat> book that I'm writing, just and I'm so sorry about my black and white camera, but anyway, in this book, Destroying Democracy uh, by Law, I have a section on India, actually. And India is a really interesting case because it too started as a democracy. This is where it's really different from China, which isn't falling from democracy. It's falling from autocracy into a worse autocracy, which has a slightly different, actually quite a largely different dynamic, I think. But with regard to India, it's much the same. Again, Modi comes to power largely because of a collapse of the other parties. So I always think that we spend too much time thinking that the people who were elected in these pivotal elections just swept the electorate up in some giant, you know, um, love fest, you know, but it's very often that all the other alternatives disappeared. So they look better than they might have looked if they had a really robust party system. And that's kind of Modi's situation, too. That said, since he's come to power, he's really played the Hindu nationalist card incredibly cleverly. And this is where he does seem to have really developed a huge number of people who literally follow him because of his apparently pious uh, life. You know, so this is the pure play for religious attachment. And that makes him quite different than someone like a Trump or a or an Orban who have no religious faith at all, but they just kind of mouth the words. Um, in this way, Modi's a bit more like Kaczynski in Poland, um, who also is like very deeply religiously Catholic and kind of, you know, he shows up at his mother's grave, you know, every month to pray for her and things of that kind. I mean, so he's demonstrating religiosity in his daily life. And that's so that there is an appeal of that. And that is something that, you know, can go along with this kind of autocratic tendency, you know, to lock down power in institutions so that elections can't get rid of these folks. But they also do have something more of a genuine base, and that's a different case. Now, with regard to China, I mean, China is not a, shall we say, a decaying democracy. It was never a democracy. That said, there is something going on, and this is to, to, to go to Sveta's um, <clears throat> earlier comment, you know, it was always going to be the case that a unipolar world was not going to last long. And what we're seeing has been the development of various different attempts to create some kind of pushback against the kind of power that's come from the EU and from the U.S. or the U.S. acting with the EU and international institutions <clears throat> to create a kind of one-size-fits-all version of what countries should look like. And so Putin's been an incredible entrepreneur in this. But you know, over the years one, that Putin has tried to form this alliance with India and China. Um, he's tried on multiple occasions. It's never quite worked. You know, then again, they're all near each other, so they don't want to be enemies. But I don't think the three of those countries have really formed a kind of solid axis yet to stand up against the, you know, the West or whatever we want to we want to call that. Still, I mean, that's this contingent. Like 10 years from now, we may say, you know, look, here it is. But they're, they're, it's part of this effort to kind of push back against the one-size-fits-all version of liberal democracy. Um, yeah, I also, you know, they're, they're one of the things we're seeing, um, and I imagine that Jamar will talk about this, uh, is this um, kind of triumph of various types of fundamentalism. And in a way, totalitarian, not in the old sense of the totalitarian state, but totalitarian mindsets of fundamentalists um, who are on these moral crusades uh, at, and will and want to have totalizing revolutions uh, at any cost. And Modi has um, been, you know, his his um, attachment to the very strong forces of Hindu nationalism um, is, is part of this, it, it's becoming in some in its more extreme versions, part of this kind of fundamentalism. Um, and in a way to Kim's point, you know, I'm uh, call me cynical because I've studied these, these people who are completely devoid of any moral code, but um and often it's been the most absolutely um, degenerate and impious people who are the most successful at like getting 
doing what's called the authoritarian bargain and where you get a religious and other elites too. You get a religious elites to partner with you. So Mussolini was not only an atheist and of course a serial rapist and a criminal, but he, he hated the church and yet he was the one who, you know, settled things with the Vatican and the, and Trump managed to have uh, both the Orthodox Jews and evangelicals saying that he was there for, by the will of God. And many of them are still sticking with him. Um, <laughs> and so that's, those are people who uh, are, are not like the ones that Kim was saying, who actually have faith, but in the age of Instagram, where, you know, Modi, he's extremely skilled, like a lot of these strong men at using the latest media technology of the age. And so Modi does a very good Instagram game at uh, Instagramming his life, including his piety. And so it's some, what I'm trying to say is at some level, especially today, whether they actually in their hearts are pious for their followers, for their images, or just faking it, um, doesn't matter uh, because they they have an or they 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 get religious elites and moral people to give them an aura of um, sanctity and righteousness. And then you can even convince people that assaulting the, the Capitol um, with a bunch of thugs was um, like a holy thing to do, um, as Trump did for January 6th. So that's the kind of, I'm using fundamentalism very broadly but of course, look what's happening in the United States with with uh, look at the Speaker of the House and the, the prominence these people are getting and what they're doing with the schools. And so this this kind of totalizing firebrand um, and, and, and Putin has done this with the Orthodox Church. Um, you know, all he, he, they're backing him and taking pictures with him. He takes an ice bath. They're there with their crosses. So that's something to look out um, for in other leaders as well. It's going to be different every time and place, but that's a very strong part of this, um, this equation. I think that a lot of people who I interact with are hesitant to engage in the religious aspect of say something like white Christian nationalism or any of its manifestations internationally, because they may not personally be religious or it's a particularly divisive or painful topic. That's very understandable. And I respect that. But I think we ought to think of religion, particularly fundamentalism as a political block. Uh, when you look at white evangelicals in the United States, uh, they're, they're, just over 20 percent of the total electorate but they wield enormous influence in state local and national politics so whatever one's faith background or 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 not if you want to understand the political landscape globally we have to understand the ways that people are deploying religion in service of their politics and um Perhaps there's a, a a similarity to Modi and other leaders in terms of them having an appearance of religiosity, them actually making an effort to say, hey, they believe this stuff. That's Mike Johnson, the new Speaker of the House, whose ascension is as remarkable as it is frightening, um, because he's a true believer in terms of his fundamentalist evangelical bona fides. He's part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Of course, the Southern in Southern Baptist means pro-slavery. That was their origin in 1845. It's also the denomination that has come under immense scrutiny and criticism in the last several years uh, for its um, failure to protect sexual abuse survivors, for its very backwards views on race, for its... Um, it, it, that's a denomination, but it's it's represented by many white evangelicals who are to this day the the staunchest supporters of Trump, and um, Mike Johnson is is one of them. And when they see him, they see somebody who would go to a church like they do, listen to the same preachers, read the same books, and it is that ideological 
social component of religion that partly that people are responding to. The other part is the fear. One of the things that that all of these leaders are doing very effectively is playing on the fears of people, whether it's fears of immigrants, fears of LGBTQ populations, fears of whatever. That is a great motivator to get people to the polls and to donate. Uh, the other factor is the the just the pursuit of power and saying that we can we can have the good old days. We can make America great again. And these are the people who are going to do it. So, yeah. Thank you. I want to use your comments um, to build uh, uh, on a question um, that we received um, from from our audience. And it's it's a question about the networks that are underpinning the, these similarities and the sharing between countries, the transnational networks that allow for this liberal turn to be a wave um, across the globe. Um, and the question is, what are these networks? Are they Christian networks connecting these countries are, and, and elevating religion as a, as a key theme in this liberal turn? Are those uh, business and economic networks across borders that allow for the funding um, of, of, of um, the, talk, the sharing of talking points? Are they political networks or, or perhaps a mix of all of those between parties that have a similar ideology? Can you tell us a little bit about the organizations, the networks and the actors that facilitate the diffusion of illiberalism around the world today? Yeah, so um, so the first thing, I mean, so there are some religious organizations that are part of this diffusion. So the World Congress of Families is the one that I've seen, certainly that, you know, has been very influential in the U.S., but also it's one of the global networks. There was a Congress of this Congress of the World Congress of Families uh, in Hungary. The president of Hungary, who is a relatively devout, although Calvinist, not Catholic, um, uh, woman, she has been a regular attendee at these conferences, and it was one of the places where the Trump people and the Orban people met regularly with other conservatives from around Europe. <clears throat> What's also interesting, though, is that there isn't really yet a kind of illiberals international, you know, a place where they all meet. What you see <clears throat> are a lot of bilateral meetings. You know, so Bolsonaro will stop in Hungary on his way to see Putin, you know, which was something that happened before the war um, last year, or you'll see that, you know, Orban will make a trip. He just went to China to actually meet Putin and so on. So there's a lot of travel among the leaders to the other countries that have these illiberal governments. So right now, you know, I think fortunately there isn't that kind of network. What there is, however, and, and Ruth alluded to this, I just wanted to say something more about it, is that Orban, because he's so much the center, I mean, he's kind of the the model for how you do this under the nose of the EU and get away with it. So Orban has created and put a huge amount of money into something called the the Matthias Corvinus Collegium, which is a kind of a, it's a boot camp training center for young party loyalists in Orban's party. It's been so successful, they're now spinning out other models. So they have a an English language version of this called the Danube Institute, which is in Hungary. Uh, the former head of the National Review, the this you know is a British guy, former editor of the National Review, a, a uh, magazine read much among American conservatives. He's the head of this thing, and a lot of American conservatives have been passing through. Roger Ayers, a regular, and Steve Bannon, of course, has been there a lot, and a lot of these Trump folks are cycling through to get the training that Orban has given, sort of to his own people. The Matthias Corvinus Collegium just set up a think tank in Brussels to try to influence people who are in the kind of, you know, EU civil service. Um, and last year, last spring, actually, they bought the largest private university in Vienna, where I think they're planning to send up set up their German language um, training institute for conservatives. So, you know, some of this is now being generated by Orban himself. Um, and there is this kind of regular... Uh, Toing and froing, shall we say, of leaders and their their staffs. Yeah, um, I was really struck. That's that's. I'm glad Kim uh, elaborated on that. Uh, and you know, these people play a long game. And let and let's remember also that Steve Bannon, uh, 
total fanatic um, fascist. He was trying to do something similar, buying a villa in Italy. You know, there's lots of, and he's he's a node. He's he lived in he moved to Europe for a couple of years working on these projects. Um, and he and Jason Miller uh, of the Trump administration were advising you know Bolsonaro before his January seventh insurrection and. And then the Bolsonaro sons are close to, you know, far right people in both the U.S. and in Italy. So some of this is at the level of diplomacy and polit politicians, families. But I was very struck. Um, and But a lot of this is is work that needs to be done. We have to uncover these things because when um, I follow Italian stuff very closely, right before the election, Giorgia Meloni, who you know, says she's conservative, but she's a hardcore neo-fascist, basically. And she was interviewed by the Washington Post. And she said that there's a whole history that her neo very neo-fascist party has had with the GOP. And she mentioned like a Republican Institute for International Affairs or something. It's not the exact title. It's a similar title. And then she said that, um, that her party, uh, which was created... To, because uh, the, the the reigning neo-fascist party wasn't hardcore enough. That's why her party was created. And it has a flame in it that goes back to the original neo-fascist party that was supposed to keep Mussolini's spirit alive. It's, it's way out there. Um, and she said that her party feels that the GOP is a kindred spirit. And there's lots of contacts. And I didn't know about this. And I still haven't had time to do the research on this. But there is a world of stuff that uh, on this subject that um, someone should investigate. <laughs> and I'll simply add that in terms of the networks, some of them are religious networks. Uh, so there's the so-called um, Seven Mountains Dominionism uh, approach in Christianity that that essentially says it, to create a theocracy in in the government. Uh, those have um, branches internationally, particularly in Pentecostal environments. Um, but in every sort of denomination or or large faith community, just as there's this rise of Ill illiberalism in in many spots, that's forcing people to sort of state a position and stake a claim on pro-democracy or authoritarianism, liberalism or illiberalism, those battles are playing out in faith communities as well. They're dividing whole faith communities. We can see this particularly in the Catholic Church. Um, and I say all that because so, many of those networks are international in nature. There may not be some separate political entity that's connecting them all, but there are um, cooperations, interactions, um, sharing of information and relationships that are also filtering through these faith communities as well. Thank you so much. We're almost out of time. So let me ask a final, very quick question. Um, that has to do again with the nature of diffusion and, and what allows and per, uh, 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 facilitates this diffusion across borders. And it's a question that again builds on um, a topic raised by one of our uh, audience members. It has to do with uh, media, um, both as media and control of domestic media being important to the model of illiberal um, change but also media as in social media the, and the way that um, these illiberal rulers use social media. So what's the role of media in how both the liberal rulers and their illiberal changes have been seen and perhaps more widely accepted? Yeah, the media question is always such a good one. This was one of the first things that Orban went after in Hungary. He already had a kind of echo chamber before he became prime minister in 2010, and then he took over the public media and so on. Um, but this is where, you know, there's the politics of media platforms um, intersects with the politics of language. One of, one of the reasons why Hungary fell so fast is because so few Hungarians speak any language other than Hungarians, uh, other than Hungarians. So as a result, 
Orban does only has to control the Hungarian language space. He doesn't care what people are saying in English or German or French or Russian or any other language, just the Hungarian language space. And that was very, very easy, uh, I think, to control. But I think now we're seeing something else going on. And that is, you know, at first it was just a matter of, of buying the television stations and of capturing the public media and so on. Now we're starting to see platforms take sides in these kinds of fights. And so, you know, in Hungary, most Hungarians were on Facebook. And before the election last year, suddenly it became harder to track people on Facebook. So you, you don't know what exactly was happening there. But I think we're now seeing with Twitter that, you know, suddenly a lot of sort of right wing and, you know, toxic content um, is kind of spewing up in lots of people's accounts who didn't used to get it before. Um, and so you wonder whether this has something to do with the way the algorithms are, are structured. But, you know, this these global media platforms are kind of beyond the regulation of any particular entity. And because they're global, they really are more powerful than states in a lot of ways. So, so yeah, and if the media platforms stop being neutral transmitters, this is an additional problem beyond the content that particular people are putting onto the, onto the, onto the web. Yeah, it, it's a huge question and we don't really have time, but um, that's Kim identified the, the, so Elon Musk is, uh, um, has, has made his, the goal is to make Twitter X into a radicalization vehicle for far right extremists. Uh, he's a bit of a fascist troll himself. He's, you know, part of the Peter Thiel. Um, it's just very nefarious um, actors with huge amounts of money and power and um, taking away. Remember, we talked about authoritarianism as removing regulations removing restrictions. So taking away trust and safety, people on his team. Uh, every time I get something from someone who <clears throat> says, you should go to the ovens because they see my name and think I'm Jewish. And uh, then I report it and they say, no, oh, it hasn't violated any of our you know, safety and trust things because they don't have a safety and trust department anymore. So uh, and TikTok is also, there's lots of studies coming out, most case studies, and now with Israel-Palestine, TikTok is a radicalization agent for many young people. So um, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge question, but uh, it, it's, hel it's helping, not hurting autocrats. We can say that. Yes, I, I agree with everything that was just said. It is something that we need to look out for and it is a major, major factor in what we're seeing today, uh, particularly on social media as well. Well, thank you all. This has been really a fascinating and quite ambitious discussion. We've touched on so many important questions, including what the liberal turn has been as a model, how it occurred, um, what the social and cultural elements of those model are, or as, as Dr. Tisby put it, how Christianity became the banner to unite under, how and why. We also talked about the political economy of the liberal turn, looked at it both domestically, looked at the success of, of this liberal turn and the conditions for its success internationally. And we concluded by thinking about it as a, as a transnational and diffusion phenomenon and some of the key actors and networks in this model, as well as the broader media environment that has allowed the spreading of this um, illiberal model. So with that, I'd like to thank our panelists for their really fascinating comments, um, as well as the organizers for this event, of this event for convening us tonight. Thank you so much, Sveta, and to Kim and Ruth and Jamar for, for joining us and to everyone uh, out there on the webinar. And um, as we've said in the chat, this will be uh, available as a as a video in, in the next few days. So please do feel free to to share um, uh, the, the link. I think they the, the issues that the panelists raised uh, will be will be relevant, uh, unfortunately, for the foreseeable future. So uh, thank you again all so much and Sveta 
for doing such a fantastic job moderating. Thank you.